thanks for coming. I won't take offense that people chose to stay at the Dries note instead of getting here right on time. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I hope I didn't set up too much expectation for humor as far as with the video, you know. It's easier to plan out ahead of time. So, um, yeah, this is getting ready for automatic updates in Drupal core. Um, I'm Ted Bowman, a principal software engineer at the Drupal Acceleration team at Acquia. Um, one of the tech leads on automatic updates initiative and a layout builder and settings tray co-maintainer. Um, so, automatic updates, why? Did people, most people came from the Dries note? I just, because I know we covered some of it in there. Did anybody not see the Dries note? Okay. All right, so why is automatic updates important? Um, so the overall maintenance of Drupal sites is high. Of course, this is not gonna solve that problem, but you know, like completely, but you know, chipping away at that problem. Um, and a lot of sites don't um, apply security updates on time, even uh, massively like the, you know, critical of critical security updates. It's usually, you know, like three weeks, I think, was like the uh, quickest we, have, we got uh, you know, 80% of sites to use that, and you know, the exploit was probably like in one week. So, um, yeah, it's, I think we can just infer by that, by for a lot of people that yeah, keeping up with security updates especially is too hard. Um, and also Composer has been a pain point for a lot of Drupal site builders and developers. Um, so I'm gonna go through a couple definitions um, because Oftentimes when I say automatic updates and then I show a form where somebody presses a button, they say, well, that's not automatic. And I say, you know, your dishwasher's automatic, but you do have to press a button to start it, so. Um, so manual update, I'm considering you go to the terminal, you run composer update, that's manual. Um, even if you wrote a script to do that, I would still consider it manual. Um, attended updates is basically you go to a form and you press a button and you update something. Um, unattended update happens on cron, you're not actually there, um, and you could be asleep while this is happening, it's unatt unattended. Um, patch version update, so this is like going from 9.3.10 uh, to 9.3.11. Uh, these are mostly bug fixes, usually, I think, usually are always no new features, and historically we try to be the lo list, least disruptive on this type of update. Um, security update does usually happen in a patch update, but um, it's usually in a security window, window not always, so you kind of know they're coming up. Um, and then it usually contains only the security fix. We don't like, oh, we're gonna do a security fix and then let's throw a bunch of other stuff in it also. So um, disruptive could be, but also try to make it as least disruptive as possible by not putting a lot of other features in that security release. Um, minor version update going from anything in 9.3 to anything in 9.4. Um, and these are unscheduled uh, six months releases and the Drupal project has a pretty good track record of, of keeping on that schedule. Um, this does contain new features, can be, definitely can be more disruptive as far as like the history of Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 than patch updates, but again, try to keep it uh, least disruptive as possible, and then major version updates from, say, nine, anything in the nine to the 10, up to, uh, to Drupal 10. Um, these are disruptive, uh, they remove deprecated APIs. We do try to make, again, try to make the process as simple as possible, but for now, we're not even really talking about this as in scope for the automatic updates module. It's not really a limitation of the tech, it's more a limitation of like the policy of like, um, yeah, things could go very bad if you if you got if we got it wrong. Um, so current status: we're beta testing the contrib module. We have had beta testers come through DrupalCon. It's gone pretty well. At 2:30, I'm doing a buff, and then after that, I'll be in the um, in the contrib space uh, or the contribution room. But 2:30, there's a buff. We're gonna try to get as many people going starting as possible. We have a script starting from nothing, or you can try it on your existing site. So um, if you can get to the terminal on your site, then we can probably test this. If you're going to the first time contribution um, area, and this is something that you'd like to contribute to as far as testing, they will set you up with like git pods, so you don't necessarily, 
If you don't know how to get to the terminal right now, they can help you set up an environment where you could test this. Um, and if you're watching this later, uh, there is on the project page, there's a link to the instructions to beta test. So as long as we're beta testing, that link will be there. And I'm sure I'll remove it if the day or not, so for sure. Okay, so let's look at the features. So again, patch version updates is the thing we're gonna support um, right out of the box. And um, so this is again going, say, from something in 9.3 to 9.4. And um, so 9.3, one in this case to 9.3.12. Um, so an example of uh, minor version support, like what you would basically be able to get away with without doing any kind of manual update is uh, 9.2.0 came out in June 2021, or yeah, and then 9.3 was released in December, and then the next June 9.4 was released, and then 9.2 support ends. So that would be like, at that point, you would need to do a manual update if we only support uh, patch versions updates. Um, so of course, if you wanted to get to 9.3 before that, you would have to do manual. But if you're okay with the bug and security fix, or maybe it's just security fixes for a year, then you could stay on the 9.2 branch and we would um, automatically update you. Um, so let's look at the update process. I'm not gonna play the video that we played uh, for the Dries note, but generally you're shown a form, you select to update, it downloads the update. What's happening actually is that, you know, it's copying your site, everything in your code base that we think is sort of composer managed, and we exclude a bunch of stuff like your public files and your private files, because again, that could be, you know, huge to copy over, and composer doesn't care about those. Um, if you're using like a uh, SQL like database, we skip that. And there's an extension system where you can exclude other stuff that we don't know about that is not considered your code base. So once that's copied over, um, behind the scenes, we run Composer on it and we say get to your next version. You're shown the update form. You can cancel or continue. Uh, by default, it's gonna put your site into maintenance mode unless you uncheck that. We really recommend you do it in maintenance mode because somebody's hitting your site while you're updating there's not much we can do in a single environment from making that work well. Um, so um, you put the site in maintenance mode and it copies the staged uh, update back to your site. And then you know you go to your uh, page and it says, yeah, you updated to whatever the latest version is. Okay, so we're gonna look at some actual behind the scenes footage of like how that works. Okay. So you have a Drupal 9, 311 site and you have visitors coming to your site. And then we make a copy of 9311, your code base, and we put it in a temporary spot. And then Composer comes down and we ask Composer to update it to 9312. And then we put your site in maintenance mode very briefly. We copy it back over. Now your main site is on 9312, what we call your active site and then we take your site out of maintenance mode, and then we destroy this staged update because you don't need it any longer. Um, so at that point, um, we'll talk about sort of the limitations of the system later, but your site has been updated via Composer, so your Composer JSON, your Composer lock has been updated. Um, I guess your Composer, yeah, your Composer JSON in this case would be updated. Um, so unattended updates, you can either select to do all supported patch updates, meaning like everything that comes out, we would update when cron, when cron detects it, or only security updates. If you do only security updates, then it's your responsibility to go to the form to make sure that you're ready for that security update. We're not gonna jump you. Cron is intended for one patch release at a time. So if you leave it on, it will for all supported updates, it will keep you up to date. If you fall behind because you're only doing security updates, Basically, when a window is coming up earlier in the week, you should probably go to the form, update to the latest minor, or the latest patch version, and then you'd be ready for that security update. We do have a warning system to say, hey, you know, you're falling behind. Um, you know, if a patch, if a security comes out right now, you would not be ready. Um, this currently is functional but disabled because, um, we are working on, and the DA working on, this thing called the Update Framework, which is a way to sign packages. It's a cloud 
it's a sort of widely used framework for um, securing update systems, and it's used by, um, the best example is there's like a automotive Linux that uses this framework. So not the exact code, but it's basically a protocol that you implement that protects you against a bunch of different types of attacks. Um, so automotive Linux uses this to update, you know, cars over over the air. Um, but you know, we wrote the functionality into the module. It's working. We tested it, and then we disabled it until on Drupal.org they're implementing the server side because it needs a server side to get the signed packages and the information about the releases. Um, so that's in beta testing now on Drupal.org. We wrote a composer plugin that goes on the client side that basically interrupts any requests to get things that are in the Drupal namespace and says, okay, I need to make sure this is signed correctly. I need to make sure that there's not, not say, like a freeze attack, basically somebody trying to convince you that there's not an update. So it, I don't know, there's like five major types of um, security attacks that it, that it protects against. And if all that is good, then it downloads it directory. To like directory. So it's not, it is through Composer, but Composer has sort of an API for you to um, check the updates after it's, before and after to say, okay, I need to make sure this is valid through my signing system. Um, so it provides update readiness checks, and these are basically periodically checking to say, hey, if an update comes tomorrow, are you gonna be able to apply it? So you don't wanna be surprised on that kind of thing. So. Um, this is an example of the status report on the status report. This is one where you haven't run the current database updates needed from however you updated last time, whether it was automatic or manually. Um, so this warns you like, hey, we're not gonna attempt to update unless you do this. So there's a bunch of stuff like, um, well, we'll get into the limitations of the system, but it basically checks the limitations of the system and makes sure that you fit them. Um, and if you have permissions to do updates, it really annoys you and says, well, it annoys you on every admin page if you're not up to date and you have cron updates enabled. Because basically you're telling us if you have cron updates enabled that, hey, I want this to be responsible for my security updates. And if we know that you are not in a current state will, will work, we want to let you know that that is the case. So not every, obviously not every site or every admin would see this, but people with permissions would because we don't want to give you a false sense of security that when a security update comes that you would be able to apply it. So this is sort of to make sure, once you're set up, this should not happen really. You should not see these errors. But if something happens and you get out of compliance with the system, we're definitely gonna let you know. Um, so there's also another part where we have modules and theme updates, and like I said in the Dries note, this is a sort of still under development. It does work, but we're still working on the validation system for this, so we'll go in later about how the validation system works under the hood, but basically we're writing the individual validators now to make sure that this is uh, completely secure. But uh, basically it works right now if, if you didn't try to hack it, but we're trying to protect it against if you tried to hack it. Um, so yeah, it basically shows you a list of all your modules and themes to update. Um, so let's go into secure the limitations and requirements of the system. So um, you need a writable file system. So if you're gonna update your code base, that means writing to the file system, so there's really no way to get around that limitation. Obviously, this is gonna make it not work on some you know, Drupal-specific hosting, um, in particular, host, like production hostings, they protect it for good reasons against it being writable. So, um, Using this in production will maybe target the long tail sites without full-time devs, and maybe that are running on lower fire hosting or say like a VPS, something where they can sort of, where the, either the hosting provider makes it writable or they're setting up something that they make it writable. Um, so possible workarounds to make it, wor to use the module even though you're in a production uh, non-writable system is, you know, you could use it in, as a sort of composer replacement locally and basically replace the part where you would usually go to the command line via going to the browser um, and then deploy as you usually would. Um, you could do it in custom writable update environments. So basically, if you have a write protected hosting, um, hosting a lot of, 
uh, some hosting providers that have that right protected will actually have different environments that have different settings. And so you could host, you could, and it's often used for like merge requests, right? So you have a merge request that you might want to review um, that is not your production site, so it's maybe not locked down as much. So you could run an update there and then merge in the same way you would do a, a merge request. Um, update event subscribers that we have that we'll go into later. You could actually make the code base very temporarily writable. Um, this is theoretical. I don't know. There's no host since the module's new. There's nobody's actually doing this yet. But theoretically, that would be possible. Or you could rely on the cron updater and have the cron updater run as a privileged user that actually does have access to write to the file system. Um, Composer 2 is a requirement. There are a lot of improvements for uh, memory usage in Composer 2. So basically, it would allow, it allows the, up, the Composer operations to happen in one web request. Um, and also with the memory limitations that, that sort of a more broad range of hosting has. Um, you know, technically, it probably would be possible in Composer 1 for some hosting environments, but you don't really want to get this wrong. So, I mean, Composer 2 is, uh, I, mean, I don't know when Composer 1's out of support, but Composer 2's been out for a while. Um, and also, it has um, API changes that make it easier for us to verify packages um, through, the, through the signing that I was talking about earlier. You probably could do it in Composer 1, but the APIs are just better in Composer 2 to do it. Um, the limitation, it's not Git or version control aware, so it's not going to commit code after the update. So you have to take this into effect. Obviously, this is going to affect a lot of people doing it on production. Not everybody. Not everybody follows strict um, version col uh, control requirements. Um, but, you know, Git is really, and version control is really developer dependent. I'm sure there'll be contrib stuff that will start to take this into account. Like I said, we do have an event system that somebody could write a Git integration for this. Um, but yeah, but out of the box, we're, it's not in scope for the module. Um, right now, it doesn't support multi-site. And the reason is, say if you did enable this on production, you don't really, there's not a good locking system in Drupal to lock um, basically on, mul on multiple sites in one code base. So, um, we lock down updates so multiple users can't try to update Drupal at one time. But if you have a multi-site, that's much trickier to do because people could be on different databases and we can't say, hey, somebody on site X is trying to update on site Y. You cannot. Um, obviously, if you're running this locally, um, if you're using it as a local development tool to get around using Composer, that's really not a concern because you know other people aren't hitting sites. Um, so we'll probably put an override in settings.php. We really can't put the override, I think, through the UI because then that defeats the purpose. If you can turn it on on one site through the UI and other sites don't know about it, then you're kind of, yeah, kind of defeats the purpose. Um, limitations, so right now database updates are not supported through the UI. Uh, sorry, not through the, uh, through unattended cron updates because basically database updates can go very badly and if you're not around there to see that it went badly, then, then it's worse. So basically, um, we detect in the staged environment, we look and say, okay, is there likely a database update? Because predicting database updates without bootstrapping Drupal is a little bit difficult. So we kind of veer on the side of like, we could have some false positives where we thought there was gonna be a database update on your site and there's not. But I'm pretty sure the system we have is will be very, very, very low possibility that we're going to do a false negative where we say, okay, cool, there's no database update. Let's run this during cron. Um, so in that case, you would just need to go to the form for that particular one. Security updates are less likely to have database updates, though that they're not, I don't think that's policy that they wouldn't, um, but they're less likely to. Um, and in the future, if this is in Drupal 10, that would, I think, would be a factor in pushing out a security update if we know, um, if we know it'll work via cron so that people automatically update it to it. If we don't put any kind of database update into it, then we would, um, you know, I think people would try very hard to make security updates work that way. Um, so let's talk about using this in a production environment versus development environment. So pros of using a production environment is it's the you know very simple way to keep your site up to date. Um, cons, obviously, what we talked about, it's not version control aware. 
um, needs a writable, uh, writable file system, and the stage update can't be completely bootstrapped. So you can't actually go browsing through your site and say, okay, everything looks good on this new version. Um, so this is something, if you're using a hosting environment where you have multiple environments, obviously you can do an update in, um, in another environment, test it out. Um, so you could, put, you could potentially, like I said, use it that way, but it'd be your responsibility from getting it from one environment to the other. Um, um, development environment um, pros is you don't have to deal with Composer directly, and once Project Browser is in, then also for installing modules, you won't have to use it directly. Um, and if you're using a development environment, you can easily do whatever you do now to get your update into version control. Um, and you can fully test the update in the local environment. Um, so using a development environment could be like a local host on your laptop, or it could be something that uh, you have a special environment that's not production. Okay, so um, let's look at getting uh, likely core ro roadmap. So this is not certain, but this is sort of what I would like. And we've talked with the uh, release managers as far as like how this might get into Drupal core. So not certain, but yeah, I think likely. Um, so each sort of step on how we get into core depends on probably how the previous step went. Um, obviously, if we do patch releases and it's something, I don't know, it's not gonna be horrible, but if something horrible happened, we're not gonna do minor releases right after that, minor updates. So, um, and I think all of this depends on the beta testing now, and when the, the stable module is contrib, getting people to use it in contrib first, because auto updates is not something you want to test out in Drupal core first, like ship it out to hundreds of thousands in site and say, okay, now we're gonna auto update. Also, the way that Drupal's experimental module system works, or policy works, is that it's harder to update something, it's harder to test an updater using the experimental module process because if the experimental module in core is alpha level stability, we actually take it out of the releases. You can still test it if you get clone, but you can't test an updater, this kind of updater, in a git clone. It has to be through a composer project. So, um, so first step would be patch level core updates. So basically the main functionality of the contrib module right now. Um, and again, that would get you uh, one year with, uh, without needing to do a manual update if you're okay with not being on the latest minor. And this would be attended or unattended updates. Um, and this would of course depend on us getting the update framework integration done on drupal.org. After that, probably minor core updates. I think probably we should do minor core updates first via the form. Um, minor core updates are, I think, almost always gonna have some sort of schema update or database update. Um, so unless we figure out that problem of running those updates via um, cron, then this is probably only gonna be on the form. So, but you know, if you're doing if we support minor updates via the form, that does give you potentially, theoretically, multiple years of without having to do a, a, a full update. So it, once we get minor updates in, hopefully sometime in Drupal 10, then you won't have to do a manual update until Drupal 11. Um, and then I think that I would hope we could get module and theme updates into Drupal core. Um, and really, like, technically it's not any harder really. I mean, it's probably a little bit harder because you have to deal with conflicts between contrib modules. But um, it's really the more the case that core is very careful about backwards compatibility breaks, about what goes in a patch release and what goes in a minor release and what goes in a major release. There's not an ecosystem-wide policy uh, in contrib to say, okay, we'll, we'll all definitely not remove any uh, API in a patch release. I mean, I'm sure most people try not to, but I'm sure people do sometimes. So contrib updates can probably be, even on a patch release version update, you can't be sure that it won't be more disruptive. Um, so we'll, the contrib module will support it, and we'll test it out, we'll see how it goes. Maybe it's, maybe I'm being, maybe I'm more worried than I need to be about how contrib module, 
theme and, and module updates will be, but I think we want to be very careful about putting that into core, and it may need some sort of like policy change, like maybe a release would opt in to, okay, yes, this is something that I'm saying is safe to automatically update, even, even during cron or something like that. Because um, I think most people who are making releases now to a module, they, they're not thinking, okay, somebody is just going to, this is just going to apply and if, nobody's ever going to see it. Um, but that, or no, they're not going to see it till you wake up in the morning, right? Um, so um, if Drupal core has automatic updates in for itself, then obviously we're thinking about that when we release a patch version. That is this something that could run during our cron update or not be disruptive. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. I'm, um, I, I think it would be great to have this because basically then all your updating for, for people who don't like to use Composer directly can be done without using Composer directly. Um, so let's take a look under the hood and basically this sort of section is okay if you're a developer and you wanna figure out like how to integrate into this new system this is what we're going into now. Um, so this is on three levels, uh, automatic updates, package manager, and composer stager. Um, and eventually this will be, the top part will be split between automatic updates and project browser will both be using this lower level uh, package manager and composer stager. Um, project browser is not doing that yet. And eventually any contrib module that wants to leverage our composer API, our, our API for making composer operations could do that. Um, so let's go back to the three sort of um, level here and let's talk about Composer Stager. This is a PHP library, it's not Drupal specific and it basically its job is to run composer operations in a staged copy of your code base. It's not you know necessarily a site, it's any composer project. Um, this is probably the least likely thing you would have to deal with as a developer. Um, it either uses a custom file copier to do the file copying back and forth, or it uses rsync if you have that on your system. Um, so then the next level up, let's look at package manager. This is an API uh, Drupal only module, meaning like no UI, and it performs staged composer updates. And But it can update any composer package. It's not limited to updating uh, Drupal modules or themes or Drupal core itself. Um, so if we look at the um, sort of screen of what we showed the update looking like before for, uh, for automatic updates, basically you kind of swap out the thing you're updating. Instead of Drupal core, you're updating any composer package as far as package manager is concerned. And then also the version constraints. Package manager doesn't have the idea of like, okay, I'm gonna restrict you to patch or um, or minor or major updates. All of that policy stuff is in automatic updates and eventually um, Project Browser would have its own policy. Um, so it also doesn't do any checking of, um, automatic updates is the part that actually checks the update XML on Drupal.org and says, okay, is this a secure supported release? Um, package manager, think of just a generic uh, updater but with this staged ability and the ability to do certain checks before it actually applies it. Um, so the update lifecycle according to package manager is create, creates that staged copy, require, this can be multiple operations for Drupal core, we're saying you know require Drupal core and a couple other, um, like the scaffold and a couple of things that come with Drupal core. Apply is to apply those changes back to your site and then destroy is destroy the database, destroy the uh, copied code base. And then during that life cycle, we have events that are fired off um, before and after each event. And all of the pre-events can flag errors to stop the operation. So I'll give some examples. So we have a pending updates validator inside package manager that says, that listens to the pre-create event and says, you know, if you have any pending database updates, then I am going to say you can't start an update. So it listens to pre-create, it flags an error if it finds any pending updates. So this would be anybody who's using package manager, we put this restriction on it for now. Um, we have one called the lock file validator, and this listens to pre-create, and it stores a hash of the active composer lock. So basically it looks at your site now, 
it says, let me store the status of your current composer lock. And then on the pre-require and pre-apply events, it'll check that hash and says, okay, has this lock file changed at all? So the active lock file. And it basically, the idea is you don't want to stage a composer operation, then somebody else through the command line run another composer operation, and now, now you're going to copy your staged code base back to your active when it doesn't know that something has changed. So basically, it locks down your site um, from, it locks down, it doesn't prevent you from doing other composer operations, say, from the command line, but if you choose to do that, it won't allow you to, to apply that update. Um, because basically, at that point, we don't, we don't know what you just did. Um, so just, this is an example of how a custom module could listen to multiple events to implement more complex logic. Um, so Package Manager provides safeguards so any module that uses Package Manager directly, either automatic updates or project browser or your custom module, um, we prevent conflicting operations. Basically, there can only be one package manager operation going on at a time. Um, so we have an ownership idea of once you start an update, your session or user owns that, and you have to claim it on every request so that nobody else can say, okay, I'm going to start. Automatic updates can't start updating Drupal core, and then Project Browser says, well, somebody else on Project Browser who doesn't know you're updating Drupal core can start to... Um, update, can start to install modules, and then somehow we try to resolve that together. So any module that uses Package Manager will sort of automatically get into that and not have to think about it at all. Just basically claim it, try to claim the update stage, and it'll tell you whether it's available or not. Um, and it also checks all the basic requirements. So the idea is you could write, um, you could write a, it's not too hard to write a PHP library that does this composer operations, but Package Manager, hopefully, being a common API, will be able to make a bunch of different modules that want to use this not conflict with each other. Um, so the events that we went over sort of allow having custom logic uh, and sort of a custom experience, so you could tap into these events to make your own restrictions um, for automatic updates, say, or project browser. Um, so this is an example module I'm going to go through called Peak Time Update Preventer. Um, and the basic idea here is that we want to pr prevent any package manager operation, so that would include automatic updates or um, uh, installing modules during one of our peak times. If, say, we're an e-commerce site and we know we're having a big sale or it's a event website, and while the event is going on, we don't want somebody updating it. So all we have to do is um, set a dependency on package manager, and then we're going to create a file called peak time validator, and this is just a service. Let me see if I get to the service file. I guess I didn't include the service file. But it's a service file. It's an event subscriber, um, and the meat of it is basically we tell it which events we want to subscribe to, and this is pre-create or pre-apply, because it could be we don't want them to start, so that's pre-create. So we're going to start, we're going to check peak time at start, but also maybe you started an update and you waited six hours and you're, oh, now I'm going to apply it. We want to check at apply. So we listen to pre-create and pre-apply, and all we do is we call a function um, is peak time. That's our custom code. You can see what it is here. Um, so it, it always may or may not be peak time. You never know. Um, but we call peak time. If it returns true, then we just add an error and say, sorry, it's peak time. You cannot update. So basically, um, you know, it's pretty simple code to sort of customize the update experience to what you need. Um, and then we are going to look at the Tedbo module preventer. So this is another um, custom module. So this is a little more complex, but we actually only listen to one event which is the pre-apply event. So basically, right before you try to apply the update, we're going to check some stuff. So we have some uh, helper classes. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to get the stage. So the stage is the thing that's doing the updater, doing the updates. And then we're going to get the active composer, so what's on your currently running site, and then the staged composer. And we're going to compare those by calling get packages not in the active. So say, okay, 
um, you know, tell me all the packages that are about to be applied that I did not have before, and then we just loop through them, and the logic basically on the bottom there where you're looping through is just, uh, this is from the Composer API that has an object for like getting information about packages. Um, and we're gonna see if any of the packages start with Tedbo slash, and if they do, we are not gonna allow you to them install because we don't trust the developer or something like that. Um, so basically, um, you know, it's our, our API stuff or helper modules is the getting the active composer and the comparing, um, comparing what's in one and what's not in the other. But um, the other, once you get the packages, this is composer's API, so this is not something that we wrote. This is something that's, you know, been around for a while. Um, so basically, you have information about your composer in active and staged, um, so you can really sort of fine grain. We actually, on the core update, um, the automatic updates, we actually do this type of comparison to make sure that somehow inadvertently when you're updating core, a contrib module or theme didn't get updated along the process because we don't support that right now and we show you an error. Um, so, but you could check any sort of, there also, one of the examples I was gonna put up but it's a little more complex is there's a number of PHP libraries that help you check security releases in any um, PHP project and you could check that to basically say, okay, did I act, any of my vendor stuff that I updated, not the Drupal stuff, but any vendor stuff, it, are there known security risks in that? Um, so automatic updates, as far as the API level, um, it really just provides the readiness check event, and which we were talking about the warnings to make sure that you're gonna be ready to update. Um, automatic updates can be customized a lot, but really you're just using the package manager API to customize the automatic updates experience. And how you do that is basically when you respond to an event, event this is the pre-create event, you just say, hey, get me the stage, which is the thing that's doing the updating, and then you check to see what class it is. In this case, the updated class is the one that we have from Drupal core. Um, this is targeting project browser. Um, so you check, okay, I want certain logic if we're using Project Browser. Important note, this is not real yet. There's not an actual Project Browser installer. But, you know, there will be one day. Um, so before we get to questions, just want to remind you about the beta testing, 2.30 uh, p.m. is a boff, and, you know, come through. Basically, we have a script um, that can go through and do the basic Drupal core updates, but if you have more, if you have more time, we can go through and do, like, test out the extension updating. Um, uh, we can test more stuff like switching to rsync on your system, see how that works. Um, and then also get involved, if you wanna get involved with the project, we have uh, a Slack, uh, which is pound auto updates on Drupal Slack. Um, you can ping me there, and we have issues in the queue if anybody's interested. But So now let's go with questions. I'm gonna take a couple minutes later because we got Dries bumped me a little bit, so. Yes? Yeah, I have a question on config. Uh, what about config after you initially set the location that should be in a row? Um, yeah, so th right now that's a... Security options? Yeah, so I think the question was uh, contrib that is not enabled as far as Drupal is concerned, but is on the... Yeah, so basically we're leveraging the update module to determine whether stuff is secure or not. And so basically the update module itself in core has a setting that says check for only installed or check for, um, for things that are just in my code base. So if you have that turned on to check for stuff that's in your code base, then, then we'll, yeah, we'll let you update it. Um, the Dru for checking if there's an update, it relies on Drupal's XML because, not package manager, but automatic updates does, because Composer doesn't know about security uh, or unsupported as far as Drupal projects are concerned. Yep. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, 
So you could, so the question was, can you tap in to, for like CI to actually run testing or something like that? So once the update is applied, no, there's not a rollback feature. But in the staged version, you could potentially write something that, that uh, does a pre-apply, listens to pre-apply and actually does whatever you want. So running tests, you could do in that case. And you could, you could, can't, you could destroy the staged version if your tests don't, uh, don't complete or, or don't pass. But after it's applied, no. There's not a rollback system after you apply the update. Um, so the, the, the actual database updates run after you apply because, yeah, we don't, we don't know how large a Drupal database is, so like copying it over and saying, okay, let's run the database updates first. Though, that being said, if you know how big your database is or if you want to make a contrib module that does copy it over and bootstrap, it should be possible. Um, though you would also have to be responsible for moving any stuff that's not that we don't consider your code base. So if you need public files or private files over there, you'd be responsible for making sure they're not excluded. There's an API for adding exclusions. So, um, so yeah. So theoretically, you could do that, but that would definitely be custom code. You could, so, so basically, summarize, you could run tests, and then you could, what was the other thing that I just? Roll back. Uh, you can't roll back after it's applied, but you can, you can cancel. Basically, yeah, there's a, just to destroy the stage. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah, moving, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can do that. You can actually access Composer Stager directly via PHP, or I think it comes with the Symphony console tool. Though if you're on the terminal, the whole staging is not as, I don't know, it's not as convenient. I mean, it doesn't give you as much features, or not a use for it as much, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the, the question was, will it be updating Composer Lock, or he's just confirming that it would? And yeah, it will be. So it basically, it is doing a Composer require update on your code base. So it is as if you did it in the, as far as, you know, if you looked in Git and did a, um, you know, Git diff, whatever, if you, you know, if you commit everything, or if you just commit the Composer files, it, you, would, um, you would see the same thing. Um, so usually, yeah, um, so config files, if they changed. So my understanding is, is like an update, the, like usually a module would use the update hooks, I think, to ensure that goes correctly. So we would detect that during, we have, a, we would detect that if it's a cron update and say, actually, we're not going to allow you to do that during cron, so unattended. Because we don't, there's not a system right now to say like, this is probably safe, you know, this probably is not a long running operation. There's nothing that would tell us that on the API level. So um, through the form, right now, if you went through the form and did the updater, it'd say, okay, we we've detected that in the staged copy, it would say we've detected updates. Uh, just be aware you're gonna have to, we're gonna reroute you to the update page, the, the database update to, to trigger it. So at that point, you could be like, uh, yeah, this is not a good time for me to do that and back out. Um, in cron, we will detect it and just say, you have to do it via the form. Right now, we don't have the notification, but um, there, before stable, there would be like an email notification that says, hey, we tried to update via cron, but we detected um, config or update uh, config schema changes or database update changes. You'll have to do this via the form. Does that answer your question? Um, if you're going through environments, right? From um, 
Yeah, this won't deal with that because it's presuming you're in one environment. Yeah. 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 Yep. Oh, if a patch fails, like through the C Wiggins patch composer plugin. Um, so right now, I think we have a detection in there. We have a validator that just checks. I'm not sure if it's committed, committed yet. That basically makes sure that you have the setting in that plugin to say fail. There's a setting for that composer plugin that says fail if a patch doesn't apply. So it doesn't silently just like say, cool, you updated. Um, so I think the only integration we have right now, and I'm not positive that we committed that change, is that we just say, you have to have that setting to say that it fails. Um, and then basically, we don't need to do any extra logic if the composer operation would fail itself and would let you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so right now, we kind of feed you the composer information directly. Um, we have a lot of verbose error messages if it's not directly from composer, but the problem is right now that I'm aware of, like I think require an update, you can't do dash dash format JSON, which would be great if you could. It would be much easier to parse. So we're going to definitely file an issue with the composer to see if it is possible to make those um, operations work with that format. Um, because then we could actually give you more useful information. Right now, we besides showing you it and knowing at what point in the process it happened, there's not much we can tell you. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so if the version's pinned, our updater will actually pin it to a different version, at least core. If you have something, I mean, we're do, we do all with, the, with all dependencies, and that we, we flag that, so that would bump the dependencies, I'm pretty sure. Um, but say if it, I'm trying to think when in case when it, it wouldn't work. So right now, the way that it works, and we'd sort of got um, feedback from the Composer Initiative, is we pin to exact versions. Um, and that's, I think, the nature of like the updater itself, you know, needing, you know, we're telling you through the UI, this is the exact version we're going through. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not acceptable in a range. So we do pin to exact versions. So um, as long as like, um, there's like three lines in the code where this actually happens, so it's pretty easy to see like, oh, this is the composer operation that happens. But it's like a, we had to do a composer up require and then it, with no updates and then, a, then an update. So, but we, if there was some bug in composer, it could be fixed right now in certain cases. But um, it will pin you to whatever version that, that it's saying it's updating you to for Drupal core. But that also could be changed if, if um, it could be changed. It's a little harder to change it. You could by writing your own updater, which is not that hard. But also, if we get feedback as far as like the preferred way to do it, we're definitely looking for more input. Um, any other questions? Uh, the actual updater itself? Um, there is, now it's, we make it whatever Drupal 9's uh, PHP version is. Uh, the core version would, we would tie to obviously to what Drupal core is. Right now, yeah, right now we're just looking at the current supported versions of Drupal 9. I forget what it is, 7.3, and, and making it compatible with that. Um, but that will bump, like you said, for Drupal 10, it'll be 8.1, I think, yeah. Anything else? Thanks for coming. Uh, so, BOF testing at 2.30, thanks. <laughs>